Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Sylvia Stevens Edward, Executive Director of the Albert Schweitzer Fellowship. The Albert Schweitzer Fellowship mentors graduate students engaged in year long service projects designed to mitigate healthcare disparities. The fellowship's goal is to train a professional workforce that is committed to a life of continued service in improving health outcomes for underserved communities. Sylvia has generously agreed to share some of her experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Sylvia, for joining us thank today. Thank you for having me. Albert Schweitzer looms very large in the field of service and particularly medical service. Talk about the organization, its relationship to Albert Schweitzer and its programs going forward. The Schweitzer Fellowship is really an outgrowth of the support for the Schweitzer Hospital originally in the 1940s. Schweitzer's philosophy of reverence for life is also pivotal to what we do. Our goal is to, I would say, rear another generation of people who know who Albert Schweitzer is, but who are committed to his service of reverence for life. So what we have uh, evolved to over the years is from supporting simply the hospital in Gabon, we originally started out with being, when we are continue to be the American conduit for funds to be given to, to the hospital in Gabon, in La Berene. Um, and we also send fellows to the hospital, medical students, senior medical students, to the hospital in, in, in Gabon. And they serve over a three month rotation there. That was begun in the 1970s, um, and then in the 1990s, 92 to be exact, um, the, you know, the U.S. program began, the domestic program, and we began sending fellows, working with fellows in graduate schools, in communities that are near and abut their schools. We operate as a way of wanting to bring together disparate people, that is absolutely, and I say disparate people, and I mean it in a lot of different ways, uh, people that go to Harvard Medical School to interact with people that go to BU Medical School that interact with Tufts Medical School. But not only medical schools, our goal now is to make sure that they interact with social workers, education, educators, theologians, to be able to understand the entire person, the whole man, as, as Schweitzer would say, and the needs that they have that are beyond acute health care. And what's interesting to me is that Schweitzer himself, he comes out of a, a uh, tradition in a belief system that is very religious, but also very humanistic, which today somehow those two um, elements are, are placed by some as, 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 as if they are at odds at each other. Mm -hmm. Schweitzer did not see it in that way. And then he, is, he was also an intensely practical man. How do you actually serve people to improve health outcomes? So you have here a combination of bringing people together coming from different environments now to serve communities, how does that, how does that actually function? Well, there's a couple of things. One thing that I think is, is intrinsic to this process is we don't take people who are not interested in serving the community. So there's a motivation, so there's, there's a, a desire. There's a desire. They must be passionate. They must really want to work with disenfranchised, underserved populations. So that's number one. Uh, number two, they also must really want to be effective in doing the work. Okay, and we also take them before they are doctors. We take them in the first, second year before they are out of school. We take them in graduate school before you actually become a practitioner, before your ideas are hardened. So we take them at that point, and I call it imprinting, if you want to use that word, that they learn at a point where they are still sponges they still want to learn, they learn the practicalities of working in a community, which is different from what you get in a textbook. So they have a desire, and, and then they're also at a point in their career where if they are not, they don't have the experience which they dictate, right. but which is dictated to them in circumstances. They're, they're still at a point in their career where they can become adaptable. They can become adaptable. And so what we want to do is have them have a positive experience, okay, and have them learn how to adapt. Uh, one of the things that we found was the research, on, especially on medical students and nursing students, when they went through the rotation in the public hospital or the community health centers, 
the majority of them came out saying, I never want to do that again. It's under-resourced. Uh, the, there's not the latest technology always at your disposal. There's not the funding to do what you want to do. So in many times, in talking with patients, you're, you're trying to figure out how you can get them to be, quote, compliant, how you can get them to do what they need to do for their health, but they have other things that are that are really grating on them and, and causing them to make other types of decisions, which to a normal health practitioner doesn't make sense. Okay, so you've got this dissonance that's going and on. And let's be clear that these are are societal problems. These are pressures of housing, of jobs, of economics, children, loss. I mean, it's a whole gamut of other things that don't necessarily, and this is one of the things that we're trying to get people to understand about the social determinants of health, if you look at what has the most impact on your health, it's not getting a shot, you know, you know, it's not those kinds of things. It's all those other pressures that are forced upon, especially people who have low incomes, to deal with first before they can get to health. Unless health is acute, which is when they show up in the emergency room, that's when they deal with it. But the other part of it, as a practitioner of social work, as a practitioner of education, as a practitioner of, of medical care, you have to understand how all these things come together to, present, to give you this person who's presented in front of you that needs help. And you can't, you can't just avoid the problem. You, you really have to invest in solving the problem. In terms of, of how the uh, Albert Schweitzer Fellowship actually functions, are you providing financial support to ensure that, that these motivated um, medical students, graduate students, um, are, are, uh, have, have a, a beneficial impact, also a good experience? The Schweitzer Fellowship actually operates on Schweitzer's philosophy of service, okay? So that means that our fellows are really altruistic, okay? We do provide a small stipend for them. Um, one is because this is America and in order for people to feel that they, when it gets difficult, because we can plot and we know it's going to get difficult, when it gets difficult, if you've taken a small amount of money, you won't walk away from it. If it's just, I volunteered and oh, this is too much, people tend to walk away from it. The so that's a very practical, motivational uh, issue. You're creating a commitment and you're locking that commitment in by this this part of it, this is in part a transaction. Exactly, exactly. So there's a contract that they sign. There's, um, they, they receive a stipend, and we have uh, sites across the country, 13, 12 to 13 sites. So there 12 to 13 sites in, in major metropolitan in areas? In major metropolitan areas. We cite our sites based upon where there's a, um, a need, and there's also enough different disciplines that you can have graduate students coming from different schools. So which, which major cities? Okay, I have to go around. Okay, obviously Boston. We do New Hampshire, Vermont together mm -hmm. uh, as a rural area. We in, we're in Philadelphia, we're in Hyas, Philadelphia right now. Pittsburgh, Baltimore, um, North Carolina. Again, we do North Carolina as a, as a rural, kind of a larger area. Uh, New Orleans, mm -hmm. um, San Francisco, LA. We have a Dallas program coming on board. Houston is up and running at this point in time. So I think that's everybody around around the country. And what's your total budget? Our total budget for the whole country is about $2.5 million. Okay. Mm -hmm. So um, we're talking about, so the stipend is a small part of it right. because we have to pay for a program director. Right. Um, and, th and that's really our bigger, a larger cost. The other piece of it is that each of the sites pay in to the national organization because we do the website, we do all the, we right. do all the backroom stuff that they don't have to do so that they can actually func focus on the programs. Some of our sites now are getting large enough that they want to become their own 501c3. We're going to see how that works out come in, the upcoming, in the upcoming year. But in any event, for the fellows, the, it's an altruistic pro program. They get to $2,000 to $2,500 over the course of the year, and it's paid out in three, in three allotments. One is when you actually complete the, the evaluation 
the program that you say you want to do with mm -hmm. the with the community and that part of it then midway through and then at the end when they finish the project in terms of of your own career you've had a very interesting um, evolution uh, talk about how your career has evolved and and what prompted you to take this step well um, I guess I would say, um, I laugh and say, I wanted to be a social worker, but I don't have the personality for it. Uh, but as a child, I, I did, I, I was a candy striper for the Girl Scouts, and I worked with this little boy whose family perished in a fire, and uh, he'd never eaten meat, ever. And he needed the meat, he needed to eat protein in order for him to heal. And I had to go to the hospital every day for about two months because he would only eat if I fed him. And so that was the, you know, that was that was my routine. And I thought, I, I just can't imagine being in that kind of a situation, and I really wanted to do something about it. So throughout most of my life, I wanted to be a social worker. I actually chose my uh, undergraduate school because I was gonna major in sociology. It had a great social work school. But then I uh, did sociology, and then you realize every time you change one variable, Right. Something else changes. Right. And so getting to that perfect place where it was all right wasn't going to happen. And additionally, I did work in a community setting, and I couldn't understand why this kid couldn't understand. And then I realized this was just not going to work for me. But my personal goal has always been to make the world a better place. So I ultimately chose to be a journalist. So um, I worked as a journalist for, I'll say, half my life. Um, and I did documentaries, and then you realize that documentaries eventually come, well, if you're a reporter, a fire today in 92 is the same as a fire in 72 is the same as a fire in 2002, so it got a little redundant. And then in documentaries, you got to the place where you lay out all the arguments, you lay out all the issues there, uh, and then you got to a place where Pay me now, pay me later, time will tell. <laughs> and that's sort of where, no matter how you, especially dealing with social issues, the same right. process that you get back to that same right. same spot. And then, um, but I really enjoyed doing documentaries. That was something that, um, that I felt I was making a contribution, educating people to understand why things are happening in your community that you don't understand because you weren't paying attention to it. So I felt I was giving you information that you could use in terms of what you could do. Then, um, so then the economy hit, they weren't paying documentary producers anymore, so I had to make a career change. And um, you do the, I had done the documentary on what do you do when you lose your job? Um, and you look for all of those skills that are, uh, that will be translated into another Right, another profession. Field. And so that obviously meant PR. But again, I didn't have the proper deference for power. <laughs> <laughs> so going into to PR didn't work. I ended up going into community relations, which again was my sweet spot, which was taking corporate resources and figuring out how they can be used to help and right. improve the community. And this was the last transition, my last job, my last transition into actually now actually taking that skill set of management, decision making, and bringing them to a nonprofit. And w when you found, when you joined um, the Albert Schweitzer Fellowship, mm -hmm. um, what was the situation when you joined? Uh, it was interesting. It was um, very the, 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 the mission of the organization resonated completely with me. This was making a difference. This was, this was going to be, or is, making, helping the next generation do better, okay? Mm -hmm. um, and so th I, I, I'm not, it was a la a, an ability to teach. It right. was an ability to, to make that all happen. But again, my, my management, piece of it was what the organization needed at, at that time. And so my management needs plus actually knowing that I would be enabling this mission to go forward was what, what resonated with me. What are the plans for the Albert Schweitzer Fellowship going forward? Are you, are you trying to scale? Um, the organization? We, we, well, one of the, the, the initial problems with the organization was they got a grant to go to, to, to scale, but they did not scale the management to go with the scale. Right. So th we, th we opened, um, before I got there, they opened six new sites, 
and overnight they were doubled their size. Right. But the management structure for doubling your size did not come efficient. along with that. And so therefore, when I came on board, it was, I call it retrofitting, to get the management structure in the place that it can support so that. So you're kind of talking group. there HR, um, the the whole uh, the business processes the business for managing process, right, your right. information systems so, right we've gone financial through we've systems gone we've just so now completed new financial system new website uh, new business plan um, before it they were looking at the national office being able to fundraise for all of all of the sites across the country mm -hmm. that's not practical it really fundraising is local and so you have to have a system that's built such that the local organization can take the brunt of that and the national organization again our goal is to raise the money to provide the the infrastructure and right. that's there and the local sites provide to, to provide the funds to keep the program going. So you do a co you're, you you have a cooperative arrangement. Right, we have an affiliate agreement now. So so we've put in an affiliate agreement. We have put in a new website, new financials. You know the whole works. So the organization is is, is so fascinating. You're doing uh, magnificent work. Thank you so much for sharing all the work of the Albert Schweitzer Fellowship, and thank you, Sylvia, for your insights. Well, thank you.